Welcome to Lawmen, the podcast about local legends and obscure curiosities from days of yore. I'm James Shakeshaft. And I'm James's conduit and spirit guide, Alistair Beckett King. In every episode, we present pieces of forgotten folklore, and at the end of the tale, apply our entirely arbitrary scoring system. In this story, we find out how a milkmaid was responsible for the construction of Durham Cathedral. Not all of it, just listen to the story. My story or collection of little stories Mm -hmm. today is about Durham Cathedral, which is where I'm from. I'm from Durham, not from the cathedral. Do you know Durham Cathedral? I don't know anything about Durham Cathedral. I can't even say it. Well, it's it's a Norman cathedral, which is, I think, about 900 years old, something like that, between 900 and 1,000 years old, something like that. So it's it's, it's pretty old by by British standards. Mm Mm-hmm. And uh, well, this is the. I'm going to tell you a few of the miracles that surround Durham Cathedral, which were all taught to us when we were in school. So some of the things are from a 16th century text, but some of the things are genuine oral history in that they were told to me, and then when I looked them up, they turned out probably not to be true. <laughs> so this is genuine folklore that is still alive to this day. So do you know Lindisfarne, Holy Island? Uh, yeah, I know. I know of it because of the group. The the band Lindisfarne. Yeah, and that I know I know that that refers to a holy island, but I have no idea what that holy island is. Well, holy island is Lindisfarne, a holy island. That's that's how he got his name, and it is where a saint called Saint Cuthbert, who is a big deal in the northeast, was alive. Uh, saint Cuthbert died, and this is like um, the year eight hundred something. So this is during Viking raiding times. Right. So saint Cuthbert died, and was interred in a in a in a chapel, which was built. On purpose, according to the text that I read, <laughs> which is always nice to know. There's, yeah, not one of them naturally forming yeah, chapels. It wasn't just a, what's happening there? Whoa! Oh, chapel. One of the <laughs> chapels. Put, a chapel. put St. Cuthbert in here. So he died and put, was put in the chapel. But, well, burying saints or people who are about to become saints is like making a cake in that you have to keep checking on them to see if they've done any miracles. Well, one of the miracles is the non... He's not corrupting, not decaying, yeah. Mm. So they checked on him after a while, and he was absolutely fine, but... Sorry to call you up on your cake-making skills, you should not be removing the cake from the oven. That is true. As I said that, I did mine pulling out a tray, um, but th- they didn't know that in those days, so they did pull him right out on the tray and then got him out with a pair of gloves and put him up on the hob. Oh, God. This was during the Dane Wars, as as the uh, the document which I'm referring to, which is called the the Rights of Durham, uh, refers to them as the Dane Wars. This is Viking raiding parties coming in and, and, and oh, causing all kinds of chaos. Mm. So they thought, we've got to get St. Cuthbert's body out of here. And so they put his um, coffin on a, on a, a, a... I don't know what they did, actually. They got it on a boat, and they, they sailed it uh, away. They, they had the idea of going to Ireland. Ooh. But, That's far. Which this is the east From coast the of the northeast, so it's yeah. completely miles away. Luckily, Saint Cuthbert had a better idea and so, sent three waves of blood towards the ship. Dead Saint Cuthbert. Dead Saint Cuthbert. This is one of his miracles. Oh, they dropped a holy book overboard and thought, "This is bad luck. We've mm. lost that holy book." And then Saint Cuthbert appeared and said, "Guys, are you going to find that book?" And they went, "Yeah, well, look." And so they went to look for the book. I'm explaining this in as much clarity as the text. They went to look for the book. They found the book. And it was in better condition than it was when it had gone overboard. Another miracle. They saw a bridle hanging on a tree. And a horse ran towards them at that moment. And that was St. Cuthbert's way of saying, you can use this horse to move my coffin around. Right. Which was deemed extremely generous. It makes me realise up until this point they had just been carrying the coffin around. So then for the next little while, they went from town to town. This is how the story was told to me when I was a kid, that they were going from place to place trying to decide where they should rest the body. I... I don't wish to be rude, but these guys sound like they don't know what they're doing. They have no... What you've got here is a monastic... A sort of ecclesiastical version of Weekend at Bernie's. <laughs> where they cart the body around with, yeah. with no real direction. They had the idea to go to Ireland, and once that was kibosh, they they lost their heads. Yeah, and, and they, they go. and this, So I knew they went from town to town, and, and so having looked it up... I know they went from uh, they went from Crake to Chester. Now it says Chester, but it means Chesterley Street, so not the town Chester. Right, another place in the northeast, which has come up in the in the, the podcast mm. before. Chester the street. So they went from Crake, and then they went to Chester, and they went to Ripon. They went to Crake, 
and they rested there for four months, and from thence brought him to Chester, where they remained 113 years. Whoa! <laughs> and then they went to Ripon, where they stayed for four months. <laughs> and then they decided to go back to Chester. <laughs> they loved it so much! You can tell they love Chester Lee Street. If you've been to Chester Lee Street, it is not... It's good. It's not 113 years good. <laughs> four months, 113 years, four months. Anyway, so that was... That shows the level of planning that went into this. These guys. By this point... The Dane Wars have finished. The Vikings have stopped raiding. Yeah, they because they've all died, all the people involved by yeah, then. Yeah, because 113 years has passed. And the monks who are told in the story as if they're the same guys, but presumably are not the same monks as, as we started with. They're still dragging St. Cuthbert around. They get to the point where the coffin stops moving. They literally can't drag it. No matter how much they try, no one can move it. And this is St. Cuthbert's way of saying, this is ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. I didn't like Chesley Street that much. <laughs> 113 years in Chesley Street. Uh, so they prayed for, they fasted and prayed for, for three days until there was a revelation about what they should do with the holy body of St. Cuthbert. And uh, they, they had a revelation which told them that they should go to Dunholm, which is the old name for Durham. Ah. Bad news is the monks didn't know where Durham was, so they couldn't take him to Dunham. But just at that moment, by serendipity, they they, they found a, a, a milkmaid or a, a shepherd girl searching for her cow, the Dun cow. Dun means brown, uh, yeah. of course. Um, so I searching for her brown cow. And she, she shouted to another girl, have you seen my cow? And the other one said, yes, it's in Dunholm. And the, the bunks all went, oh, like Dunholm. And then they asked directions. And, and this is... As told to me, the climax of the story. Um, so the, what? Yeah. So finding out from a milkmaid where Dunholm is is the climax of the story. As they were going, a woman that lacked her cow did call aloud to her companion to know if she did not see her, who answered with a loud voice. But her cow was in Dunholm, a happy and heavenly echo to the distressed monks, who by that means had intelligence that they were at the end of their journey, where they should find a resting place for the body of their honoured saint and thereupon with great joy and gladness brought his body to Dunholm, which was, in culture tell us, a barbarous and rude place replenished with nothing but thorns and thick woods, save only in the midst where the church now standeth. Of course, now there's an Argos as well, so it's, <laughs> it's not that bad. First of all, they built a little church of wands and branches, um, and then they replaced that with a white chapel, and eventually it was, was replaced that- with... On purpose, or <laughs> I believe all of an accidental say, chapel. These may have been a series of accidental chapels until they deliberately built the great Norman castle. What is it? Half castle against the Scot is the way it's described, engraved on something nearby. This particular one, the, the, the Durham Cathedral. Yes, yeah, so it's oh. it's a bit it's it's a sort of a stumpy keep out of here kind of a cathedral. It's not so much to the glory of God as a sort of a uh, mm. and a bomb bomb kind of a castle, uh, kind of a cathedral. Um, there is one more part to the story that I've forgotten. Is it they pop back to Chesterley Street? <laughs> Presumably. It was great, all guys. The would occasionally sneak back to Chesterley Street. What's in Chesterley Street? Very little. It was a Roman settlement, but there's not... I mean, there's not a lot there. We would go to the Argos. But they've got one of those in Durham now, so... Yeah, you don't need to. You don't need to go. Oh, that was it. Yeah, so the whole of the hill was covered with thorny bushes. And Uthred, I think I'm going to pronounce that... Uh, Uthred, Earl of Northumberland, aiding them and causing all the country now, this was written hundreds of years ago, and their spelling of country is unorthodox. <laughs> all the country to cut down the wood and thorn bushes which did molest them, and so made all the place where the city now stands habitable and fit to erect buildings on. So there was a lot Maybe of- if they're being uh, molested by bushes, maybe their spelling of country is... <laughs> oh, maybe. I mean, it, it, it paints a horrible picture of what Durham used to be like. That, now, you might think that that would be the last miracle that St. Cuthbert performed. What? Yeah, the one where he said Dunholm and then the cow. Right. Yeah. D- d- do be impressed, because that's a very impressive miracle. It's still, it's m- memorialised on the side of the cathedral. There is a carving of a cow with two women standing next to each other. Not looking at it, wondering where it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, it's it's symbolic. Um, and, uh, and I believe it's described as two women in the costume of George III. Presumably meaning the period of George III, not both of them dressed as George III. Or maybe George III liked to dress as... Um, as milkmaid. Mil- that mm. um, so it's definitely true, because it's carved into a cathedral. Right, yeah, Can't that's fair Although, um, that, you know, the, the, the carving is obviously much more recent, because it's in the costume of George III. The, the text there is from the 16th century, and all of this happened way back in sort of the year 999. Which and- started 
in 800 it's start, something. Yeah, but, <laughs> but for a long detour in Chesterley Street. Mm. Um, so the the historic, the contemporary accounts don't mention the, the dun cow bit of it, so it's probably a little bit of local folklore. Um, uh. It's also a bit of a coincidence that the cow is also the same colour as dun, dun home, dun cow. Brown cow. It's kind of a bit neat, um, and at the same time doesn't make any sense. Yeah, they really spiced that story up didn't mm. they, with this lost cow <laughs> eavesdropping. Yes. I Come on, this the, the bl- waves, is, we've got waves of blood. We need we need to top that. That bit is extremely popular, where I'm from. But his his most recent miracle, to my knowledge, is St. Cuthbert's Mist. Ooh. Yeah. So, guess which century this takes place in? The 20th century. No. Second World War. And uh, this was taught to me as fact as a child, and I've looked it up, and all I can find are accounts of other people telling it to other people as fact but nothing to back it up. So, in the Second World War, Hitler was out to bomb Durham because it's of no strategic value. Mm -hmm. And he was evil. Well, there is a story, because he did try and bomb... He did successfully bomb Coventry. There is a story that they they were targeting um, historic towns in order to to lower morale. So, they were trying to destroy beauty spots. So, it is And Durham. And Durham. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, it's really improved. Since we got rid of the molesting bushes, it's it's got a lot better. Those days are long gone. So, uh, yeah, so he sent his bombers out to bomb Durham, small city. But it was a a cool moonlit night, um, exactly bombing weather. Mm. Bomber's moon. Is that a phrase, bomber's moon? Well, it was was bomber's moon. However, an unexplained mist suddenly rose up as the planes approached, enshrouding the entire city and hiding Durham Cathedral. And mm. so they just had to drop their bombs on... Uh, I, th- and I think there was a record of this, someone else's house, which is very <laughs> bad luck for that guy that he that St. Cuthbert didn't live in his house. But Durham Cathedral was saved and, was, and, and Durham was never bombed in the Second World War. Ah. Uh, there are other versions of the story and other reasons for why they were trying to bomb it, but it, the basic story is that, that the mist rose up to protect the cathedral from bombing. The problem really is, it's sort of a bit of a, a two fingers to Coventry, as if to say, I haven't got any good saints, Coventry. <laughs> yeah. oh, what about you, Dresden? Yeah. Uh, here I shoot. It's a little bit unfair mm. to other cities that have experienced bombings to gloat about the fact that you were fortunate enough not to get bombed. I don't think they have records of, of whether or not they tried to bomb somewhere but didn't successfully bomb it and dropped the bombs somewhere else. So, right. So how we know, how the people of Durham knew that they were trying to bomb Durham that night when it got foggy, I don't know. But that is the story as it is as it is told and believed as unimpeachable fact. Well, it's very lucky that those Nazis didn't overhear a couple of milkmaids <laughs> looking for a cow. Yes, there are there are two other small uh, semi apocryphal or uh, apocryphal mm. asides. Mm. One is that uh, on the on the way into Durham Cathedral, oh three, uh, Durham Cathedral has a massive door and uh, a lion shaped door knocker, and there, there are two of them. And once on the news in the seventies, someone said, "If you want to see a nice pair of knockers, come to Durham." And hasn't it's, the moment has never been forgotten. Was that not Blue Peter then? It might have been Blue Peter. There was a thing about Blue Peter about knockers. Didn't research. This is oral history in that ah. I didn't research any of the bits that are just from my memory of childhood. <laughs> right. That's what makes this genuine folklore, the possibility of it being nonsense. Right next to where the the knocker is now, there is a mound with a monument on it, and that is su- supposedly a mound from all the bodies of dead Scotsmen when they tried to attack Durham, and they all got killed, and then they were piled up, and now that mine, that mound it's just a big pile of horrible corpses, which oh. is sort of the grisly story that was told to us as kids. But then they uh, sort of dug into it and did a check, and it's full of dead Scottish people. Oh, so, right. yeah, it's turned out to be accurate. Uh, it's kind of a thing, and I think some people are saying that they should get the bones back. Or uh, Anyway, mm. horrible. Mm. Finally, it's got a secret passage. Or does it? Ah! Uh, well, uh, uh, there is a story of the secret passage being tested by um, a man going down there with a horn, mm. uh, and everybody else staying up to listen to where he goes. So he would go a few paces and then would go and they would listen a few paces on, he would go, and then move along. And they were trying to work out where it went. Um, I've got a very sceptical expression on my face at the moment. Well, just just it, want to point that out. The story's about to get super plausible. All good. After after presumably 40 minutes or so of, they heard an alarming sounding, and then that was it, never again. And nobody ever went in it again to check. So that was the end of the story. Something happened, and no, and presumably nobody ever went down into the hole again to find out why. But that... In fairness, according to um, Westwood and Simpson, there are various versions of that story across lots of different parts of the country. Well, it's a great story. He's in a tunnel and then... 
it's a good story, but it's undermined. Is that really the best way that you test a tunnel? I mean, I would horn. take a torch down there or something. some string. Yeah, and uh, yeah, a rope is un- un- yeah. un- 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 unfurl some string. Not a horn. But you do have the the, the very hilarious uh, sound effect at the end that presumably implies a person's death. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, it's, it's got it's got light and shade. Yeah, exactly. That's that's why I decided to to end on it. Um, so th- those are the historical and modern miracles of Durham. So the scoring system. The, the, the scoring. scoring. <laughs> so the scoring system. No, <laughs> the scoring. The, okay. Um, scores for this story. My first category for you is supernatural. Well, this is high. These, there's a number of miracles. Three? At least three. At least three. Let's... Uh, okay, I'll, 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 I'll list them. Lack of corruption of the Lack body. Lack of corruption of the body. Uh, waves of blood. Book gets washed overboard. Different book. Comes back better. They found a different book. <laughs> the guy that no, dropped miraculously, it over. Miraculously, they miraculously found a better book. No. A horse suddenly appears. A horse and bridle. Horse and bridle. Um, the coffin stops moving. Y- yeah. Then he tells them that he wants to go to Dunholm. Yeah, how did he do that? It's not clear. Okay. Presumably he appeared and said, I want to go to Dunholm. And where's and they said, where's that? And he said, what? And then that was the end of the... And um, then, then the miracle of meeting someone who knew where Durham was. The miracle was. of overhearing. The miracle of overhearing where Durham was. I mean, we're into the we're into the second hand. I'm counting on my fingers with miracles. <laughs> and of course, the saving everyone from Nazis. Not saving specifically the people of Durham from Nazis. That is, that is yeah, Cuthbert's Mist is quite yeah. miraculous. But definitely the book one. You're not having that one. That is <laughs> the guy that dropped it off, got another one, and said, oh, look, I found it. And they're like, well, shouldn't that be ruined because it fell in the sea? And he's like, miracle. No, it's <laughs> it's a lot better condition. And it's got all different words in it as well, and that's a miracle. It's now a better book. Yeah, I think that's what might have been what happened there. All right, well, that- um, Horse, mm, bridle. Yeah, okay. Oh, so the bridle's a miracle, but the horse isn't. If what you, is your metric, sir? If you hung around after they these monks had put this coffin on the horse and towed it away, you might have had the miracle of the man finding his horse that he'd let off the l- leash. You might have the miracle of him being really angry. Yes. <laughs> these monks... Okay, scores for miracles. None you do have a lot of miracles. I've got a lot of miracles. I've, I've packed them right in there. I'm No, I'm doing a lot of debunking. On those miracles. Mm. I've debunked. I'm attempting to rebunk as many of them as I can. Uh, but I think they're bunk. Bunk, you say? Yes, bunk, sir. <laughs> well, tell that to a carving of two milkmaids in historically inaccurate garb <laughs> on a building. It's physically What inaccurate. more proof do you want? Well, yeah. No, uh, you've got a number of miracles. I'm going to give you a four. For a story with nine miracles, you're giving me four out of five. It's not nine. It's not nine miracles. It's easily nine. It's, it's probably some I forgot. That's how miraculous the whole story is. Good, but yeah. The second traditional category is naming. Naming. Hmm. Ah. Lindisfarne's a lovely name. Lindisfarne's very nice. Where, what is AKA the origin Holy of the Island. name? I don't know. Is it li- li- Linda's Farn and that means Holy <laughs> Island? I don't. Yeah. No, it, yeah. It's not like Linda's Farm. farm. What else have we got? Dun. We've got Dun Home. We've got the Dun Cow. Yeah. Chesterly that- Streets. <laughs> Chesterley Street is a big, a firm favourite of mine because and, and of the monks. <laughs> Everyone likes Chesterley Street. They, they, Chester the Street. To sell you on naming, the, why isn't this, it Chester Larue? Because that would make it sound like a prostitute. <laughs> Danny Larue's brother <laughs> Chester. Chester Larue. I don't, I don't know. I didn't name Chesterley Street. Chester the Street. <sighs> Two. Two. All right. I'm going to have to grab a little back with Nazis. The next Ooh, category is Nazis. Well, punch in the face to a Nazi there. Take that, Adolf. Yeah, and your, your I boys. Don't think none of our other historical legends of England have featured any Nazis. No, no. So this is 100% more Nazis. Yeah, and none of our other, actually, tellingly, none of our other historical things have, have actually actively tried to subvert the Nazis. Yeah, so in, in essence, all the other people will collaborate. Yeah, no, I think, yeah, that's got a score high for sticking one in the eye to the Hun there. Um, so, uh, give it a... I'm going to give it a four. Because you can't bring yourself to condemn the Nazis wholeheartedly. Is that, <laughs> is that the reason? No, because St Cuthbert, he didn't he didn't cause a mist that caused the Nazi planes to crash. The Luftwaffe, I was mm. believe they're known, to crash. He They still did bomb someone. Yes, yeah, they did. Although it wasn't um, Durham. Yeah, he looks after his own, does St. Cuthbert. 
He's not even from Durham. He just wanted to go there. Yeah, so what was that four? Yeah, four. Yeah, I'll take four because I feel like mm. it's dropping by yeah. a minute. Okay, four. The category of bad planning. Yes. I mean, yes, massively high for this. These monks, they are bad at planning. <laughs> they are bad at planning. They are very bad at planning. They Who who spends 113 years somewhere, goes somewhere else for four months, and then decides to go back to where they were already? To see the world. You've got a you've got a dead saint in in the boot of your car you could go anywhere <laughs> even the start of their plan is flawed they wanted to f- they wanted to sail from an island on the northeast coast of england to ireland yeah famously on the west coast of england so they had to get all- they had to go all the way around scotland yeah there's no panama canal there's no misnamed panama canal <laughs> in england these guys uh, can i pin you down to a number for bad planning we've established that the planning was extremely bad the two plans that they did make were not to the tastes of their corpse, which yes. one was go to Ireland, another was go back to Chester the Street. <laughs> yeah. And then they could they rely on serendipity to even find where their where the, the their corpse wants to go. Yeah, so a massive score five. Obviously five out of five for bad planning there. Excellent. My final category, secret passage. Yeah, that's got a yeah, it's got a secret passage that that, that goes who knows where that's one and no one wants secret. to find out where now it's dead oh. and you'll notice what i've done having learned from your errors mm. is is, uh, is made the category singular so uh, ah. i'm asking you to rate it in terms of secret passage rather than in terms of secret passages ah uh, yeah 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 you got me yep yeah yeah there's nothing i can do there's nothing i i'd love to but I can't. I think I have you banged to rights. Yeah, Secret Passage. There's one, and it's great. <laughs> I'm going to give it a four, though. Ah! Because that horn thing, I made a very sceptical face about the horn thing. I remember it. Would that even work? Would that even work? That'd have to be a very shallow passage or very... Loud horn. You're just going to use your imagination. <laughs> Sorry. I'm only going to give it a four because the horn thing is great, but a bit, it seems a little infeasible. It's it's the element of the fact that it obviously didn't happen that I think is mm, affecting you. Yeah, that's... Right. But what what I think is positive there is that it's an endorsement that all the rest of the things definitely did happen. Yes. Yeah. Since what you find un- unbelievable about this selection of stories is that a man could play a horn underground. So what's, what is your final score? Four. Uh, four? I thought it was going to be worse than that. No, because it's br- it's got a brilliant ending. It's it's. <laughs> Thank it's you. Ending. This story is about a bunch of idiots. Should we get into the Yubberton Yawnies? Let's do the Yubberton Yawnies. The Yubberton Yawnies. Am I pronouncing that correctly? You are, however. You wouldn't be able to tell that by reading it because it's a town called Ebrington. 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 E b r i n g t o n in Gloucestershire. Locally, it's pronounced Yubberton. 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 And Yubberton Yornies is the name of the local people there who are. If you think of a village idiot, this is a village full of idiots. <laughs> this is where they all came from. These are the original. This is the source. The author of the book that I'm taking some of this from. So he spoke to an Ebrington man who has many of the yawny characteristics. He used to do this thing, which in this book is referred to as a prank, which is horrible. He would have a packet of boiled sweets with him and he... Right, okay, I'll just read it. He always carried a bag of boiled sweets about the place and when he saw one of the younger children, he would say, Oh, gear, sweet, if you'll be a cuckoo. And so the young child would hold his head back and then he would spit in their mouth. Is that the prank? That's a prank. Whoa. No, it's not, is it? That's it's, horrible. It's simply disgusting. And Although then, I, I, when I, I did, do remember doing smell the cheese when I was... A, that's punching, I was punching it? in the yeah. nose. And how does a horse bite... I don't know that one. How does a horse bite? Oh, don't do it to me. Red rag to a bull. Um, <laughs> you would go, how does a horse bite? And they would, like, as you demonstrated, go, I don't know how does a horse bite. And then you would get your full hand and grab the underside of the thigh... And just pinch really hard, but with a whole hand. Oh, We had this other one. For some reason at our school, this would work. It would be, you would go, do you lick a today? 
<laughs> and, what, and, and presumably the person would go, yeah, sorry, what was the question again? <laughs> so he'd do this prank, which, again, that's not a prank. However, the Yubbert and Yornies have some great stories about them, which kind of, most of the stories do fit into the, the style of a joke. So, for example, in Ebrington Church, they have a tower. And the Yubberton Yornies were jealous of Chipping Camden, nearby Chipping Camden's church. And so they wanted their tower to be bigger. So how do you make things grow? You put manure around them. So they put manure around the base of the tower. And then as the manure settled, there was a stain on the tower that made it look (laughs) like it had grown that far out of the muck. And there's a poem. This story is immortalized in a well-known local rhyme. I've got the full version here. Master Southam, a man of great power, lent a horse and cart to muck the church tower. They muck the tower to make it grow high, but not as lofty as the sky. And when the muck began to sink, they swore the tower had grown an inch. Doesn't really rhyme. Maybe I'll try, I'll try an accent. <laughs> yeah, Any can you accent? just keep saying that until it rhymes, please? Yeah. And when the muck began to sink, they swore the tower had grown an inch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, the sky bits even, that's a bit. They've chucked that in for the rhyme. They muck the tower to make it grow high, but not as lofty as the sky. And another story is that they wanted their... Ch- and ch- another church-related story. They wanted their church on top of the hill. They have uh, two churches? This is the same church. The same church. They were not satisfied with this church, the Yubberton Yornies. <laughs> real One sense of bit. church envy here in Yubberton. They wanted the tower higher. They did the muck thing. And then in a separate incident, they wanted the tower on top of the hill, maybe to make it seem higher. So the tower wasn't currently on top of a hill? No, it was near a hill. They wanted it at the top of the hill to show it off. But they stick it to them chipping Camden lot. <laughs> I hate, I hate Chipping Camden so much. They, they got all the Yubberton Yornies together on the lower side of the church and they tried to push the church up the hill. And they what they'd done is they'd left all their coats on the top side and then someone, probably from Chipping Camden, came by and nicked all their coats. It's the sort of thing Chipping Camden yeah, might do. Yeah, they're, I just, they're horrible people. And so they tried to push this church. They, could, they obviously, they couldn't move it. It's a church. That's not how this That's works. That's not how you move a church. A shed, maybe. But then they went round and all their jackets were gone. So they thought they'd push the church over, over their, their jackets. jackets yeah. <laughs> oh, um, I've got an eyewitness account of the uh, attempt to move the church. They had the foreman of the bell ringers saying, right oh chaps, when I says heave, heave. So they heaved and they heaved and they heaved and the sweat was pouring down their faces. He says, right oh chaps, that's it. Well, in the meantime, of course they didn't know, one of the pranksters of the village had nipped up and pinched all their jackets. Of course, when they went to put them on, there was nothing there. They says, good God, look what we've done. We've moved a tower onto our jackets. It was a mistake to put the jackets there. Because even if they were able to move the tower, they would have moved them on. They should have... I think they deserve everything they get. (laughs) I mean, I'm spotting a pattern of impossible church-based operations which they, due to their idiocy, believe they've achieved. Yeah, so in a way... Is there anything else that they attempted to do with this church and then subsequently believed they'd achieved? I mean, it's not reported here, but I wouldn't put it past. We can only assume that was happening on a, on a bi-weekly basis. Yeah, they, they did try to cage a local cuckoo so that the summer would never leave their village. That's a nice idea. They would then put their clocks forward to make it Christmas sooner. They're stupid. They sound like idiots. Uh, Apart from this one, this spitty man one, who's got a real... I don't know. He's got a nasty edge to him. He's, I'm sorry to have brought him up. In fact, I, I would maybe want to cut him out because... It's given, it's tainted the Yubberton Yornies, which is, it is actually just uh, an enjoyable tale of laughing at simpletons to a sinister man who's spitting in children. <laughs> well, now let's be, so, I don't think it was I an adult was man tra- spitting no. into a child's mouth, uh, I thought, which is a distressing image. I'm sure it was a child spitting into a... He was older than the of, other the children. He was definitely... Oh, he, was, he was abusing the, pa- the privilege that his age would have given him at that time at school. Well, that's that's inappropriate. Mm. But I imagine over in Chipping Camden, things are much worse. Oh, yeah. They wouldn't even give you a sweet. <laughs> The opening bargaining position is spitting in your mouth. The sweets are never on the table. Uh, oh, and they've got the... This is a classic um, 
there are many villages and towns around the country that are considered to be the stupid town where the stupid people come from and they they have they've got their version of a man walking home at night past a moonlit pond and thinking that the reflection of the moon is a cheese and then so he tries to get this cheese out he probably falls in <laughs> <laughs> he lost commitment to telling the classic moon's fallen in the pond story there yes uh, another yawny um carried a wheelbarrow seven miles to prevent the wheel from denting the ground. Do we have a name for that, Yorny? Or is this uh, another anonymous? Just these Yornies seem to all merge into one. Mm, a, t- a total, total idiots. But good value. I don't think I've ever heard of a village of idiots I- I- with quite so many church-based misapprehensions. There is a Yubberton Yorny revenge story, however. <laughs> what? <laughs> This is not the revenge story. This is another one. This is the other church-based story. What, the, uh, th- Whoa! Uh, are you telling me this is the third church-based misapprehension story to be found in Yuberton? Oh, you bet. So they lit a bonfire on top of the church tower, and when the lead began to melt, they had no idea what it could be. And there's a, there's a poem about it. Some Yuberton fools, to show their power, they lit a fire on top of the tower, and lead ran down like blood from a slaughter. Old women went running to catch the soft water. I mean, that's got a horrible ending, really. That's, yeah. that's not as bad as losing your coats or having a church towel that smells of... Yeah, I don't... Uh, that's got old women dying. Well, or, or at the very least being seriously burned by molten metal. Yeah. Which is poisonous as well. Yeah. So it, well, not, that... just, not just normal molten metal, but poisonous metal. Now, here's the Yubbert and Yorney's revenge story. Yubbert and Yorney's revenge story, let's hear it. So during the Second World War, when all the signposts had been removed, to confuse Germans, so a posh motorist asked the way to Morton in the Marsh and was told, well, I don't know. Well, what about Chipping Camden then? Well, I don't know. Good gracious, man. Don't you know anything? I knows where I be, and that's a damn sight more than thee does. Ooh, so the... Burn. Is that the revenge story that, there? Well, that's one of the two. Because, that's the lesser. Because the, the Yubbert and Yorney comes out not quite on top, but at least parallel. Another anecdote. Oh, this, yeah, this must have happened during the time when there were no signposts, because a stranger stopped off at a local pub to ask the name of the town, and when told it was Ebrington, he commented, Oh, that's where all the fools live. Well, says a local, I don't know that they all live here. We get plenty passing through. Oh, <sighs> burn! I'm, I'm not sure if mic drops had been invented at that time. They would have probably dropped an actual person called Mike. <laughs> These yawnies. That would have been the only From the church. <laughs> I'm, I'm starting to think that it's a, it's a tricksy law. This, yeah, 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 I've forgotten how to pronounce it. Yubberton. Yubberton. Yubberton yawnies. This idea that they're all idiots. And then whenever we go there... We're scoffed at and have our mouths spat in mm. by the horrible people who live there. Yeah. So, do we? Uh, is it time to give a score to the Yubbert and Yonis? Do I read the category? Yes, you you read the categories. Okay. So that's the format of our show, and I shouldn't need to explain it to you yeah. every single time. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, but I feel bad. You made me feel bad now because you've got a sad face on. <laughs> um, the Yubbert and Yonis scoring. There's okay. a way you could turn that frown upside down. Uh, let's go for the first one. <sighs> supernatural. Supernatural. It's a hard zero for yeah. me because there's nothing supernatural. That they, uh, they may be sort of preternaturally stupid, if that makes any sense at all. When people say preternatural, I think of a man called Peter Natural. <laughs> <laughs> like, he's like... They were as stupid as Peter Natural. Yeah. Um, they're very, very stupid, but I don't think that actually... They there's nothing supernatural in the story. I'm they sorry, weren't spookily... Yeah, it wasn't sinister or mysterious or outside the realms of science. It's not like a village that had been accursed to be stupid. They just, they didn't make the effort. You think that they'd have realised how stupid they are as well and they'd sort of worked on it. I mean, they, there are the um, the sort of the zingers The revenge stuff. stories, yeah. yeah. That suggests to me that, the, that, that they did start to turn it around after many centuries of being the butt of jokes. Yeah. They just they just didn't understand physics. That was the main issue. That's their main problem. And that, whilst that may be the explanation for some supernatural events, is nothing to do with this. No. So it's a zero for supernatural. Okay. Naming. Naming? Well, that's quite good. You've got Yubberton Yornies. Yubberton Yornies. Or Yornies. Edrington Yornies. Yes. Are there any other names in the story? No. So you are you are leaning heavily on Yubberton for the naming category. Yubberton Yornies... 
And your your knees, uh, your knees is quite a nice word. It describes them quite well, I think. It suggests they're slack jawed. Yeah, so it's sort of. It's not. It, it's sort of you visualise slack jawed idiots. A country bumpkin. Bump bumpkin type. Going our. Yeah. I thought I'd realised that bumpkin was a reference to people from the country being inbred, you know, that sort of trope. Yeah. Because I thought, oh, bump kin. Kin being family, bump <laughs> sauce, spice. No, I looked That's it up. What, so what's, it's what's... Dutch for a barrel oh. or a little tree. Barrels are idiots. Stupid and barrels. So... so we need a hard so... number for the naming, which the name is so good that they used it an incountable amount of times. Mm. So you're trying to make a, an asset of the fact that the same name is just repeated. And they're, they're the almost like... They're marketable. They're like the minions. Yes, they're exactly. Livable. Thank you. I think it's a, it's a three. Which it's a is, three. Which That's is good. very good considering it's just based on one name. Brilliant. I'll stick with that. Uh, okay, next one. Church Envy. Church Envy. It's through the roof. It's, yeah. through, it's through the church roof. Yes, which they probably did in some way to make their church better than Ch- those... Chipping Camden, was it? Chipping Camdens. Um, mm. Yeah, I think it's it's an unarguable five out of five. I don't even, I don't think I even need the pitch because no. I've never heard of a story with so much church envy or rivalry. The whole the whole the whole issue between them and Chipping Camden seems to stem from Camden's absolute pimp of a church. Who do you think built the Yoberton Church in the first place? Like, was it like a guy from Chipping Camden in disguise? Coming over and going, ah, I'll make you a church. It'll be, yeah, you don't want to put it on top of the hill. You don't want it too high. <laughs> so hilariously building them a, a subpar church. Yeah, a, a poor church. I don't see any of them qualifying as architects. They would have just buried a cross and thought that's how churches grow. <laughs> or, just, or the Jesus tree, as they called it. So church envy, bang on, five out of five. Five out of five for church envy. Excellent. Oh, yeah, now this one, this got to be good. This category, sick burns, mm. the Yubberton Yawnies and there. Yeah, they really, they sort of surprise with their, um, with the, the power of their comeback. So we've got two wartime based sick burns. Yep. Um, and, and we've got the, the, I don't know if, if spitting in someone's mouth is a sick burn, but it is sick behavior. It is. Yeah, it is sick. And I think it might in... sting at the, to say, rather than burn, but it's horrible. Mm. Mm. Well, we'll gloss yeah. over that for what's potentially a five out of five. And the the old ladies running to catch um, sweet water from the of melting lead yeah. would literally have been burned in what is... Frankly, so, sickening. A sick, sickening... The sick burns sustained by the elderly the, the women. old women. How could I... I'm going to say four out of five. Whoa! I'm going to say four out of five. First of all, because you asked for a five. Yeah. And I, I want you to learn a lesson. <laughs> and secondly, I think there are... There are the, the, there are so many stories in which the Yobbiton Yonis lose that don't feature a sick burn. So I feel like if uh, if Chip and Camden were, were sort of coming in and saying, and that's how you don't move a church or something. I, yeah, I feel like there were some opportunities for sick burns missed. That's all, that's all I'm saying. Also, from the sound of it, it happened during the war when a lot of the more able-bodied and perhaps able-minded people were out of the country. Mm. So the Yobbiton Yonis were... The best that there was. <laughs> All the, the best of what's left. Mm. So, I suppose I'll take that four then. Mm. That's what a sad note to end on. You seem genuinely sad. I think it's just... shouldn't have nailed my colours to a hideously burned old woman. listening to Lawmen. The Lawmen are Alistair Beckett King and James Shakeshaft. If you enjoyed Lawmen, please rate and subscribe in all the usual places. And if you didn't enjoy Lawmen, we'll f*** up your church tower. <laughs> <laughs>